Today, as we worship together, we're reminded of the importance of repentance and confession in our relationship with Christ. And being able to accept our need for forgiveness is, is fundamental in our, in our faith and our worship. It comes as we admit our roles in the crucifixion, that uh, our sin was, uh, was very costly. And through our worship today, we want to highlight uh, through our scriptures and through the songs and through the message that will be shared, the, the redeeming power of God in our lives that we have access to through our faith, our willingness to repent of past mistakes and by confession of our sin. Let me read for you a scripture today. 1 John 1, 7 through 9 says, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray together as we dedicate this time to the Lord. God, I thank you today for this blessing that we have of your word and, and the opportunity we have to come together and worship. And we're so grateful that you have uh, given us this opportunity. And Lord, now we turn this worship and we praise uh, together toward you that you might be glorified and magnified in our lives, not just this morning, but throughout each day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh God, you bless everyone who sins. You forgive and wipe away. You bless them by saying, you told me your sins without trying to hide them. And now I forgive you. Before I confess my sins, my bones felt limp, and I groaned all day long. Night and day your hand weighed heavily on me, and my strength was gone as in the summer heat. So I confessed my sins, and I told them all to you. And I, I, I said, I'll tell the Lord each one of my sins. Then you forgave me and took away my guilt. There is a truth older than the ages there is a promise of things yet to come there is one born for our salvation Jesus there is a light that overwhelms the darkness
you Lord and we should always pray whenever we find out that we have sin then we won't be swept away by a raging flood you are my hiding place you protect me from trouble and you put songs in my heart because you have saved me let's stand together you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding but must be controlled by bit and bridle or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad. You righteous, sing all you who are upright in heart. Some may trust in horses some may trust in chariots, oh, but I, I'm going to trust in the name of the Lord. Some trust in the riches, some may trust in all in Holy Spirit power, bring redemption power. 
for singing with us. We're going to send our kids back right now, those uh, fifth grade and under that are going over, or fourth grade and under, whatever it is, for our uh, grow time. And for the rest of you, we're going to give you about five minutes to say hello to folks. And uh, and did you need to say something? Or are you just moving in? Okay. So, you, so uh, kids gather at the back to go over for grow time. And the rest of you all, five minutes of fellowship. And, uh, you know, be praying and encouraging. All right. All right. Hey, go ahead and get your Mark journals out. We are in Mark chapter 1, verse 1. And um, if anybody needs a journal, if you don't have a journal, just raise your hand. Some very nice person in the back of the room will bring you one. Does anybody need a journal? All right, good. Um, while you're turning to that, uh, last week we talked a little bit about how this book, this gospel of Mark ended, and it was a little bit abrupt. You know, that's what kind of all of the scholarly people say. But the truth is, the beginning of the gospel of Mark is a little abrupt as well. So Mark may have had a pretty similar style. Some of the other gospels begin with the genealogies of Jesus. Mark doesn't. Some of the other gospels begin with the, the baby Jesus in the manger. Mark does not. Um, it begins with the message of John the Baptist. And uh, he's called the Baptist because he was the baptizer. He was the one that was going out and baptizing people. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. And he had a miraculous birth. His parents were not able to have children, but God blessed them with this miracle and John was born. But it doesn't begin with any of that. It begins with John the Baptist, but it begins with his message. Now, we're not exactly sure how much of these accounts Mark may have witnessed firsthand. He would have been a young man during the time of Jesus' ministry, but most of his testimony, we do know, comes through the testimony of the Apostle Peter, and certainly all of this is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to remind you of the times in which they lived, because that's important for us to understand as we launch into this, this new book. Israel was oppressed during this time in their history. They were living under the rule of the Roman Empire. They were overtaxed and overburdened. They were overrun in every way that you can imagine. Not a single day goes by in the lives of the people living in this nation of Israel where they don't feel the full weight of the, the boot of Rome on their neck. And then we look at this message of John the Baptist recorded by Mark. And as we do that, we want to look at his listeners and understand how they would have heard his message. But we also want to look at the totality of Mark's writing. And so we look at the recipients of his writing and how they would have understood this writing. And to do that, we have to travel back in time about 700 years earlier. Isaiah had prophesied about the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of John Isaiah had seen his nation fall into oppression as well. The Babylonian Empire, the Assyrian Empires had carried off the people of Israel in many cases. And his inspired prophecy looks forward to this day of God's rescue, this day of God's salvation. So listen to Isaiah chapter 40 verses 1 through 5. Isaiah through speaking for God, he says, Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. So this oppression, this terrible time that you've been living in, Isaiah is saying it's coming to an end. And then he prophesies John the Baptist. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and, and hill be made low. 
The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so for Isaiah and for his listeners, they were hearing these words of God's rescue and God's salvation. And they knew that it was going to be the end of the Assyrian captivity, the end of the oppression that they were living in. Salvation has come. Now for John the Baptist and his listeners... There may have been a misunderstanding in this one. They heard about this rescue, this time of, of salvation. They were thinking about the end of the Roman occupation, the, the end of the Roman oppression, that a new king was here and a new kingdom would be set up. But then as Mark writes this gospel and those receive it and they're reading it and studying it, we understand that what he's really talking about here is the end of our bondage to sin. That we are no longer slaves to sin. That salvation has come. And so the big idea of this message, if you'd like to write this in your journals, the big idea is this. And, and I, I use this word very specifically. The best news. The best news is that a new and most glorious king has come. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So it's not just good news. I mean, this is the best news. And you need to remember that when we're talking about a king of Israel and a new king coming onto the scene, talking about Jesus, God never intended for the nation of Israel to have an earthly king. He was to be their king. He was all that they would ever need. But they whined and they begged him. They wanted to be like all of the other nations that were around them. They had kings. They wanted to have a king too. And eventually God gave them what they wanted. And this long line of kings began. Some of them were good. Some of them were bad. But at this point in history, it had been 400 years since God had last spoken through a prophet. And the people had been waiting. They had been hoping for deliverance. And so Mark begins his writing with John's message. And John's message is that the time has come, the new king is here. Now I think it's so important that we understand a little bit of John's heart in all of this. John draws a crowd. He's out in the desert. He's going up and down the Jordan River and people are coming. Actually, the scripture says that all people from Jerusalem and Judea are coming out to the wilderness to hear John and they're responding to his message. And so John is getting lots of attention. And I just want to be completely honest and confess to you today that most of us preachers can't handle the kind of attention that John was getting. We just couldn't handle it. But John takes all of that attention and he redirects it all to Jesus. John 1.29 tells us of a time that John the Baptist was there and he saw Jesus coming toward him. And when he saw Jesus, he drew everyone's attention to Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. One time, John's friends were watching so many of John's followers that kept coming out to the desert to hear John teach. And they were leaving John and they were beginning to follow Jesus. And they were asking John about that. And John answers them with his purpose, his very purpose for living. I told you he had a miraculous birth. His very purpose for existing is in his mind when he answers them. And John 3.30 he simply said, he, talking of Jesus, must increase, but I must decrease. I love not I, but Christ, and how this story reminds me of that. So that's the context that we're stepping into. We can cross-reference many stories about John the Baptist with other Gospels. But let's look to Mark, and let's look at his message. And so, in your journals, Mark chapter 1, and beginning in verse 1, we read, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What a wonderful way to start your writing. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now this word gospel, it does mean good news. It means glad tidings. But when it was used in the language of that day, it describes the best news possible. So it's not just good news. It is the best news that you could ever imagine. And in the New Testament, as we are so used to hearing this word, and we think of, okay, a gospel, we think of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the stories that tell of Jesus' life, of his, of his ministry, and, and that's all good news. And so we call those four books gospels. But when we read the word gospel in the New Testament, it is never, ever referring to one of those four books. 
it is always referring to the message of salvation. And so when the Jews read this, Mark says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. When they read this, they're thinking, oh, so it's an ascent of a new king, sovereign to the throne. He, the one that's going to be able to produce salvation and peace and happiness in this kingdom. But to the Gentiles, who were actually Mark's primary audience of his writing, he's writing primarily to, to Roman Christians and to Roman non-Christians that would read this history of Jesus Christ. To them, what would it mean? Well, this was still a very common word among the Gentiles and among the Roman Empire, and it, and it was used often. I read of one time in 9 BC, it was on the birthday of Caesar Augustus, and he was given this birthday present, I guess, and it had this inscription, and I'm just going to read part of the inscription. It says, speaking of Caesar Augustus, it says, He is the one who will bring to us the work of a benefactor, the work of a savior, Make war cease. Create order everywhere. This gospel, same word that Mark uses, this gospel has come to men everywhere through him. Again, it's talking about Caesar Augustus, so they're wrong about all of that, but they're using this word to describe him. So Mark's chosen a word that spreads itself across Jew and Gentile cultures. And he's about to write the history of a new king. A king that is set apart and set above all other kings. And his name is Jesus Christ, and he is the Son of God. Jesus, his earthly name, a fairly common name of that time. Christ, his title, it means Messiah, anointed one, the one sent from heaven. And then his lineage, his heritage, the Son of God. He is the new king. That's verse 1. Then Mark moves on to the herald of this new king. Because anyone of that day, when they were hearing about a new king, they would expect someone to go before that king. A king didn't just show up and say, hey, everybody, my name is Frank, and I'm your new king. No, there was always a herald. There was always someone that would go before him to announce his arrival. And so beginning in verse 2, we read this. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger. Who's the messenger? John. John. John the baptizer, I send my messenger before your face. Who will prepare your way? The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And then John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey, and he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So John's clothing as unusual as it sounds, and Mark draws our attention to that. It was actually a pretty common uniform for a prophet, beginning all the way back with the prophet Elijah. That's what he wore, and so prophets kind of wore that garb throughout history. In fact, it's also said that John came in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. He's living in the wilderness, and he's eating what was available to him there. Wild honey was everywhere, and locust was a pretty good source of protein. I read a little bit about how you can prepare that, if anybody wants to know. You can ask me later. It's a little bit of a process, but I highly recommend you go through the process if you're going to try to eat locusts. But as we said before, John was drawing lots of attention, and he humbly continued to turn all of that attention to Jesus Christ. John says here that the one who is coming, speaking of Jesus, I'm not even, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and to untie his sandals. John's saying... This is the lowest task of the lowest ranking slave that you could ever imagine. That's why it was so significant when Jesus got down on his hands and knees and washed the disciples' feet. Two Thursdays ago, our teens had that experience at their Bible study. It was the lowest task that could be done. There was actually a law that stated that a Hebrew slave, because they believed that a Hebrew slave was a higher rank than a Gentile slave, that a Hebrew slave was not allowed to, you know, to have to get down on his hands and knees and take someone's sandals off. That they, they weren't even that low. 
And here John says, I'm lower than the lowest of all slaves, that I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals. Again, drawing attention to Jesus. And he's saying that's how great the separation is between who Jesus called the greatest man ever born of woman when he referred to John the Baptist. That's how great the gap is between the the greatest man ever born of woman, which is everybody, and Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Precious course, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We
let's look a little bit at the ministry of, of John as recorded by Mark. Number one, if you want to write this in your journals, number one, John prepared the way for Jesus by straightening out crooked paths. John prepared the way for Jesus by straightening out crooked paths. Now, this prophecy goes all the way back to Isaiah. It's echoed by Mark, and it's describing this ancient custom. And the people there that were hearing this would have been very familiar with it. But when a king was traveling or a new king was on his way, he would send a herald ahead of him to announce his arrival and to clear out the obstacles. And they would literally go in there with crews that would straighten out crooked roads, that would level hills, build bridges, but then beyond all of that, that they would get the people ready. Hey, the king's going to be traveling through here. And when he gets here, I want everybody to be ready. I want you to be wearing your best. I want you to get cleaned up. I want you to be ready to meet the new king. He would get the people ready. Listen to how Luke describes John in Luke chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. He says, For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And so Isaiah and, and Mark and, and Luke, they describe John's task. It's to prepare the people for the arrival of Jesus. And his biggest task may have been to remove any obstacles that stand in the way. So what would you say some of those obstacles would be? What, what, would John, what obstacles would John have to remove or, or what path would he have to straighten, figuratively speaking? Traditions. Okay, the traditions that have been going on for centuries, and he has to step into that. Definitely an obstacle. Anything else? Ken's dying to say something, but I don't know. He's biting his lip. Um, think that, that John steps into this and he, he has to remove these obstacles to get people prepared to, to experience Jesus and to hear him. And, and sometimes we, we step into that and we have an opportunity to read our Bibles or to study or to worship or to be a part of a Bible study. And there are obstacles that are in the way. We're to move those. I want you to think all the way back in the days of Moses where God instituted a sacrificial system. And I want you to think about what that was when it was first introduced, when it was first, when it was first instituted. So from among all of the animals that you've raised, you're to go out and you're to choose the best one, the one without any flaw, the one without any blemish. And you bring it to the priest where it will be slaughtered, and then the priest will take blood from that animal that you have raised, and he'll sprinkle it on the altar, and then you will be granted forgiveness of your sins, temporarily forgiveness of your sins. Now, when I look at that, I always thought that the priest did all the dirty work, that you would walk in, and, and I mean, it's kind of heartbreaking if you love animals, especially if you've raised this animal, and it's your favorite because it's kind of perfect, and you walk in there, and you would give the animal to the priest, and then you'd kind of cry and hold your head down, and you would kind of run away, and then the priest would do all the dirty work. But my understanding now is not that, that that's not the way it was at all when the system was first instituted. Here's what I've learned this week that the family would gather around that animal and that they would all place their hands on the animal, everybody in the family. They would place their hands on that animal and it was symbolic of, of your sins passing to that animal. But then the head of the family would be the one that would cut the throat of that animal and the priest would be there to gather up some of the blood and he would take that blood and sprinkle it on the altar. And this was symbolic for God placing our sins on Jesus while he was on the cross, where his blood was spilled, bringing forgiveness to us once and for all time. And I wonder if maybe one of the big obstacles, a ritual that they had been a part of for centuries, it was the only life that they had ever known, I wonder if one of the big obstacles was that maybe they had gotten a little bit relaxed and a little bit lazy with their worship of God. That they were no longer offering their best, 
okay, it's time for the sacrifices, go grab an animal, that they were no longer raising their own animal, or they did raise animals, but they weren't going to offer one of those. And it was just really convenient to just buy one at the flea market right outside of the temple on, you know, when you get there, instead of traveling with that animal and having to take care of it and everything. Uh, we'll just buy one when we get there. It was easy, it was convenient, and yes, it was a bit lazy. And it seemed to check all of their boxes of responsibility. I'm supposed to choose an animal, I'm supposed to sacrifice this animal, and it's supposed to be the best I've gotten. So when I get to the flea market, I'll choose the best one that's there. And so in their mind, they thought that it was checking all of their boxes of responsibility. But here comes John the baptizer, and he gives them a different message. And he makes it clear that what's missing from this whole process is repentance. It is a change of their heart, and it is a change of their mind, and a change of the direction of the way that they're living their lives. And I believe that repentance would straighten the path between Jesus and our hearts, that repentance will do that. Number two in your notes, if you want to write this down, John proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's what Mark tells us. John proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This repentance that creates this straight path, it also leads to action. And this word repent, it would have been a common everyday word that they would have been very familiar with. And it simply means to change your mind or to change your direction. I want you to imagine that when you leave here, you're going to travel from here to um, St. Augustine. And so you're going to get out here and you're going to go up to Route 50. But let's say you hang a left instead of a right. You begin to travel west on Route 50, but you're really sincere. You just you think that that's the way that you're supposed to be going. It probably won't take you very long. If it does, you'll hit the Gulf of Mexico. But it probably won't take you very long until you realize that you're wrong. And so you change your mind about the direction in which you're traveling. And you make a U-turn. And you completely change. And then you begin to travel in the right direction. And John is teaching here, and he is convicting the people. You say that you want to enter into the kingdom of God. You say that you want to go to heaven, and I need to tell you that you're traveling the wrong way. You're trusting in thoughtless ritual or dusty heritage or your ability to keep all of the rules. And you need to change the way that you're thinking about all of this. You need to turn around. You need to make a U-turn. You need to learn to hate your sin like we talked about a couple of weeks ago. You need to trust in God's mercy alone because nothing that you can do will, will deserve God's favor. And so repent. See your sin and change your mind about how you think about your sin and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin. In a few minutes, David Wood's going to lead us into our communion time. And he's going to talk about the transition that's taking place here from that Old Testament ritual into Jesus Christ. And I appreciate the words that he's getting ready to share. And I appreciate the opportunity that we have to remember that sacrifice of Jesus. But John proclaimed a baptism of repentance that was for the forgiveness of sins. And what you may not know about this baptism is that it was a very revolutionary idea at this time. And it was God's idea, not John's, but it was revolutionary. You see, the Jews didn't get baptized for any reason. It wasn't part of their ritual. It wasn't part of their custom. They had lots of ceremonial cleanings and hand washings. Jesus was sometimes criticized for that. Why does he go in and eat and he didn't wash his hands? Remember, some of that kind of stuff was going on. But there were no baptisms. Who here thought that during the days of Jesus, every church had its own baptistry? Anybody believe that? Well, there were no baptistries, right, David? Right. Why? There were, no churches. there were no churches. There were no churches. There were no baptistries. And this whole concept of baptism, especially for the Jews, was a very, very new concept. The only baptism that was performed was performed when a proselyte, that is a person that is a Gentile, a non-Jew, wants to join into the Jewish religion. And they would immerse that person. They would baptize that person, symbolically showing that they are humbly leaving their pagan history and they are accepting the one true God. The Jews were very proud people. They were proud that they were God's chosen people. They were proud of all of their religious rules and how good they were at keeping them. And John declares to all of them, you all need to be baptized. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of your sins. He's saying, listen, you guys are no better than anyone else. 
You're no better than the pagan Gentiles. And you need to humble yourself and repent and be baptized and then receive forgiveness of your sins. John's telling them that they're no better than anybody else. So he's saying, don't let your pride prevent you from repentance. Don't let your pride prevent you from being baptized. Don't let your pride prevent you from experiencing the forgiveness that comes only from God. I guess because, you know, he lived in the desert and he ate bugs and wore what seemed to be described as this crazy outfit that I always pictured John the Baptist as this crazy man. And that's why people were going out there. They were going out there because, hey, it's a crazy guy and there's nothing on TV tonight. Let's go see what he's saying. And he was wearing a big sandwich sign that says, turn or burn. And he was ringing a cowbell. And so everybody went out there. And that's not the picture of John at all, really. You know, he was wearing what prophets wore. He looked like a prophet. He preached like a prophet. And they were going out to hear what this prophet, and they'd been waiting for 400 years. And yeah, he was harsh. But he was harsh with the religious leaders that had led the people so far from being sorry for their sins and so far from God's will for their lives. I don't picture him as a crazy man screaming at everybody. I picture him pleading to people. With love, repent of your sins. Prepare for the Lord Jesus Christ is here. Paul writes to the young preacher Timothy and tells him about the, the kind of character that he should look for in leaders of the church. And listen to how he describes this because this is how I picture John the Baptist. 2 Timothy 2 verses 24 through 25. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. John's goal wasn't to win an argument. His goal wasn't to beat people up. His goal was to help people escape the snare of the devil. Begging them to leave his trap behind. Begging others not to go near where there is danger. The most loving thing that we can ever do is to lead people to spiritual freedom. But you know, sometimes our religious ritual becomes very easy and convenient and even a bit lazy. Instead of being focused on God's word and repentance of our sins. John preached about judgment and we learned from these other Gospels, he preached about wrath, he preached about eternal fire, and he preached about separation from God, but he also preached about God's grace. And that drove people to a desire to want to deal with their sins, to repent and to be baptized. This new king is a king of judgment, but he's also a king of grace, and forgiveness is offered. Number three in your journals... People responded by being baptized by him and confessing their sins. People responded by being baptized by him and by confessing their sins. You know, in a court of law, confession is an admission that I have violated a legal standard. And confession of sin is an admission that what I have done is in violation of God's standards and that I am in agreement with God and his ways are right and his ways are correct. And we're given lots of examples throughout Scripture, but if you just think about the Ten Commandments expressing to us God's will and God's standards, He gives us standards for how to worship Him, how to honor Him, how to honor His name, how to remember Him. He gives us standards for honoring our parents and standards for sexual purity, standards for personal integrity and how we should view the physical things of this world. And any time that what I do or what I say or even what I think is in opposition of God's will, then I stand guilty before him. I love what Paul says to the church in Corinth who had in many ways strayed so far from God. 2 Corinthians 7 verses 9 and 10. He says, as it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved. So the people that Paul's writing to had been grieved. And he says, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief, listen to this, for godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. 
And John taught that a confession without repentance, it's nothing but lip service. It's nothing but words. It's like admitting that you were wrong, but you have absolutely no desire to change your behavior. That just means you're sorry you got caught. John preached repentance and preparing the way for the Messiah. John preached that our repentance should lead to fruit that is evident to the world around us and certainly to God. That we are to have a change of our mind and a change of our attitude, a change of our direction, a change of our behavior. And that change, it leads us to confession. When you really change the way that you think about your sin, you have this desire to tell God, God, I agree with you. I was wrong. I've changed my mind. You have a desire to tell others that you were wrong about sin as well. The Bible says if we confess our sins to God, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when we have wronged another person, it's certainly appropriate to seek their forgiveness as well. The Bible says confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And when you have a time of confession, don't try to justify what you did that was wrong. I mean, we all do that, don't we? It is just such a natural tendency. Well, I wouldn't have done that if you hadn't done that or if my circumstances hadn't been like that. Just don't justify. Don't explain it. Don't try to blame shift. Just have this honest, gut-wrenching confession. You've heard the old saying, confession is good for the soul, right? It's true, it is. Because God wants us to live with a clear conscience and a pure heart. He wants us to experience what life is like to be free of the guilt and the shame of our sins. Lord, I come. I confess bowing here I find my rest without you I fall apart you're the one that guides my heart Lord I need Yes. 
God, how I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. If you don't have one of these cups yet, raise your hand, you'll be given one. Traveling Wilburys was a rock group that was composed of Bob Dylan, George Harrison, Jeff Lynn, Roy Orbison, Tom Petty, and they wrote and sang a song, Handle Me With Care, which is a song about some troubles that the songwriter had experienced. And there's, there's a line in that song that goes like this, I've been uptight and made a mess, but I'll clean it up myself, I guess. But the problem is, no matter how hard we try, we can't totally clean up the mess we make of our lives. You know, we can clean up spilled milk, but we just can't clean up our own lives. Sin leaves the, this indelible mark and stain that can only be cleaned by the blood of Jesus. Now, there's nothing wrong with trying to correct mistakes we've made. Pay back debts, apologize for bad choices, tear something down and start over. We definitely should try to undo and fix as much as we possibly can. But we also need to recognize that when we sin against God, it can only be forgiven by repentance and by the blood of Jesus. No amount of effort on my part can cleanse even one little spot. And John the Baptist began laying the foundation for that truth when he started preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John was preparing the way for what Jesus would do on the cross. It was a transition from the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament to the sacrifice of the Lamb of God on the cross. The animal sacrifices and John's baptism both looked ahead to the cross. And both would have to be done again and again each time you sinned. But you hold in your hands that which represents a sacrifice so perfect and so complete that we neither have to offer animal sacrifices, nor enter the waters of baptism again and again. Because Christian baptism has the one thing that John's baptism and animal sacrifices did not have. And that's the blood of Jesus. The body and the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that Jesus came. He came in a body that would be broken on the cross so that his blood might be shed for the perfect and complete forgiveness of our sins. Please forgive us of our sins at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. These next few verses that we're going to look at, verses 9 through 11, they're mentioned in all four of the gospel writings. And, and it is the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus. Uh, the writer Luke tells us that Jesus was about 30 years old at this point. And this is the only time mentioned in all of scripture where Jesus and John are actually together. They've communicated with each other through their disciples. They've, they've uh, sent messages back and forth. But this is the only time that we read that they were actually together, except for when their pregnant moms got together and the baby jumped and, you know, and, and all that. So you can count that if you want to. I see, these next, <laughs> I see these next verses as the coronation ceremony of this new king that John has been announcing. So listen to verses 9 through 11. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. 
And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. John's message was a message to prepare the people for the arrival of Jesus. And it was a message of repentance. And John preached and performed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people were responding by being baptized and by confessing their sins. And then Jesus comes along and he's baptized by John. And it leaves some people, including John, scratching their heads. And today there are some churches and some preachers and some authors that have some agenda to attack the deity of Jesus. And this is one of the moments in history from Scripture that they point to. See there, this proves that Jesus wasn't a perfect man, that he had to be baptized to have his sins forgiven. Others say Jesus was just a regular man and it is at his baptism when we read about the Trinity coming together that he actually became deity. They're all wrong. Jesus had always been the perfect Son of God. And when you read the Son of God, as at the very beginning of Mark's writing, that is God. The Son of God, that is God. That is God the Son. He had no sin of which to repent or to confess or to be forgiven of. And it's in Matthew 3.13 that we read the account where John the baptizer sees Jesus coming up and he's like, Oh no, <laughs> you know, I can't baptize you. you. You are a perfect, sinless man. I am a sinful man. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus says to him, this is necessary. This is fitting. And he tells him the purpose. The purpose wasn't to forgive Jesus of any sin. The purpose was to fulfill all righteousness. And every time that I hear or I read that word righteousness, I can't help thinking about what happened on the cross where our sins are placed on Jesus and his righteousness is placed on us. Do you understand that? When God looks at you, when you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, He doesn't see your sins. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. And so Jesus was baptized not to be forgiven, but to symbolically identify with sinners, as He would on the cross where He passes through death, bearing the sins of the world. And then Mark tells us that there's this beautiful picture of the Trinity, of, of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all coming together. It's both visual and audible. Nowhere in Scripture do we read any language in the original Greek that tells us, that, that to gives us any reason to think that this was a vision that someone had and it was recorded. No, this happened and the people that were there experienced it. They saw it and they heard it. And it's this incredible picture. It's the highlight of this coronation of the new king. Mark tells us that the heavens were torn open. That's the same word used to describe the, the curtain of the temple being ripped by the hand of, of God himself when Jesus died on the cross. The heavens were torn open and it sounds like something really violent is about to happen, doesn't it? That God tore open the heavens, but then the spirit descended like a dove. That's what happens. The Spirit descended like a dove, not in the form of a dove. He didn't look like a dove. I know that we have a lot of Bibles with the picture of a dove on the front, or some churches have that in their logo, and that's totally fine. But just understand, the Holy Spirit didn't come looking like a dove, where people said, oh, look, it's a dove. No, He, he, he descended like a dove descends. The heavens were torn open and instead of something violent happening, the Spirit descended with gentleness and, and patience the way that a dove would, would slowly and, and gently glide down and then come to his resting place. And at that moment, we hear the voice of the Father, You are my beloved Son. With you, I am well pleased. And so we have gone full circle from Mark's introduction. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God to this new king, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And John's, John's calling was to prepare the people to meet Jesus, to hear his message, and to respond by following Jesus. So as we wrap this up, I just want to ask you, if there is anything keeping you from following Jesus more fully, 
If there is anything that is an obstacle in the path between you and your heart and Jesus, if there is anything crooked that needs to be straightened out, then the next step that I want to encourage you with today is this. Confess and remove anything that has become a barrier between you and Jesus. Confess to God that you agree with His standards, that He is right and that He is just, and that you want to remove all obstacles between you and Him. If you've wronged someone else, then confess your sin to them and seek their forgiveness. But confess and remove anything, any pride, any bitterness, any conduct, any behavior, any attitude, any thought that has become a barrier between you and Jesus. Don't just say you're sorry, but change your mind about your sin. Learn to hate your sin and let that hatred of your sin lead you to change your behavior. Again, agree with God and His standards. According to John's message, that straight path between you and God will prepare you to meet the new king. And friends, at the end of the book, we read that He will return. And when He returns, He will return on a white horse as a victorious king, and He will return in judgment. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. We should be very well prepared when He comes. Our Father, we thank you so much for your love. Lord, your patience, your kindness. Not only did you send Jesus into the world to forgive mankind, but you even sent John ahead of him to prepare the people. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would prepare us. Prepare us to meet him. Prepare us to know him. Shine a bright light in all of the dark corners of our hearts. And Lord, whatever obstacles are there that that get in the way of us knowing you better, Lord, would you just, would would you tear them out? Would you violently rip them from our hearts? I know that sounds painful, but Lord, it is for our own good. Forgive us of our sins. Be with us as we strive to walk with you, Lord. Help us to not be lazy about our worship of you because you are worthy of our worship. Help us to not be prideful about our background or our history. But Lord, help us to not let our history hold us back either. Lord, today can be a day for anyone in this room whose heart you may be tugging right now towards you. Lord, today can be the day where their history changes forever, where their direction changes forever, where they cease to walk in their own ways, seeking their own desires, and they seek to walk with you in agreement with your will. So Lord, if there's anyone here today that has not met you and your grace and your forgiveness in the waters of baptism, that has not repented of their sins, that has not confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they do that. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If that's a decision that you'd like to make today, we're praying for you right now. And we'll pray that you do that as we stand and as we sing this song. If you'd like to come up and talk with me or pray with me, let's do that. Stand and sing. Are here moving in my midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are a good, 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 good,
today, one of the things that we try to always encourage you to do is if you have feedback that you would like to share, uh, we want you to be able to do that uh, as a means of testimony or encouragement. And uh, I wanted to share something with you all, and it's not my desire to, to uh, add on to what Frank said, because I think Frank covered it perfectly, but one of the things that I was thinking about, I, I had a conversation this week with a, a dear old friend of mine that I have prayed for for 30 years, that does not and does does not want to have a relationship with Christ. And uh, I know it's crazy, isn't it? Ministers actually have friends that aren't Christians. Um, but we've been friends for a long time, and he knows where I stand. He has a great respect for me, but he has no desire to follow Christ. And the times I've talked to him, I've asked him, you know, what prevents you from knowing more about Jesus? And he's, he says, I don't want to. He says, there's, there's nothing that I can find in, in, in Christ. And I said, well, that's not true. But he says, but that's how I feel. And so I pray for him and I encourage him all the time. Tell him things like, man, I just want you to know I love you, brother, but, uh, you know, I'll miss you when, when I'm in heaven and you're in hell. But, no, I don't, I don't ever say that to him. <laughs> Maybe once. Um, no, but I pray for him because he's a friend. And I want him to come to that repentance. Now, I don't know every person, why they came to, to hear John. But they all left with some impression. Some of them left no different than when they first heard what he had to say. And it reminded me this week when I was talking to my friend about the story of Josh McDowell. You know, a young man in college studying to be a, a, a lawyer. And he decides to write a legal piece on um, how Jesus doesn't exist. That there's really no evidence for Jesus being the Son of God. He was an agnostic and he had no desire to know more about Christ. What he wanted to do was to disprove what he considered foolishness. So he set out looking for the evidence of who Jesus Christ was. And today one of the, most, one of the best selling books of all time in Christian faith is Evidence That Demands a Verdict. The basis of that legal argument he began to formulate that as he found out more led him to know who Jesus Christ was. Now my friend, I love him, but one of the things that concerns me for him is this. He doesn't know who Jesus is, but he's too lazy or uncaring or apathetic to know more about him. He's never made the effort as much as I've encouraged him He's never made the effort to say, let me know more about Jesus. This, this guy that Dave feels so much passion, so much desire for me to know more about. 
Like I say, is it laziness? Is it apathy? I, I, I don't know. But I want to challenge you all today to encourage you that if you don't know enough about Jesus Christ, don't be lazy. Don't be apathetic and go, well, I just don't, I don't want to mess with it. Find out more. And maybe when you find out more and really study to know who he is, you'll find you know him a little bit more like Josh McDowell as well. Maybe it won't. But you'll never have that situation where you simply say, well, I don't, I don't know who he is, but I don't care. So I wanted to share that with you because maybe you all have friends that go through that. Maybe you've experienced that and might be able to encourage someone else through that. Anybody else have something they would like to share this morning? Okay. Well, the next item of business I would like to say is a word of praise. Uh, this past week, we kind of pulled a fast one on you. We do that a lot, don't we? We pull fast ones on you like, hey, there's no picnic today. <laughs> we pulled a fast one on you last week, a couple weeks ago, and said, hey, we really want to help out this mission need in uh, Myanmar. Uh, they're just going through a lot of crisis and, and Judah and his, his staff, all the people over there working and serving or setting up refugee camps and trying to do everything they can to help. And we put it before you and said, we know it's not a fifth Sunday, but we're going to make Easter Sunday our fifth Sunday missions emphasis. And I just, I thank you. I'm thanking God first because I know he encouraged and stimulated your hearts. And uh, uh, this week, you know, tomorrow morning, I'm going to be able to send a check for a little over $5,200 to help Mission Myanmar. And if there's somebody here today that goes, oh, I didn't realize you were doing that and you want to, we'll add it to the offering. If you have something you want to share, I'll put it into last week's offering and make sure it gets to them and to help them out. And so what a blessing God is in his generosity and how he gives it to you and, and you're generous in return. So thank you so much for, for doing that. And, and I, I, I know it will be an encouragement to their ministry and the work that they do there. Um, I would also want to encourage you that, yes, we did pull that fast one. Uh, after looking at the weather that seemed to be unchanging, we decided we're going to push back our picnic a week. So same thing as, as, as it was supposed to be this week. We've got the grill out there ready to go. Uh, we're going to cook some hamburgers and hot dogs. We've got uh, buns that I assume will still be good. Frank, or, or Frank and I will feed them to the ducks, one or the other. Um, but uh, we want you to come next week, bring, bring a chair, Bring a, a, a heart ready to celebrate and to fellowship. And, and uh, if you want to bring out some games you like to do, uh, like I say, maybe we'll get some, some of those guys. I know Ronnie might, might talk Ronnie into bringing his, his bow out again. That's right. There, cornhole. We got, we got it all. So, so come out next week. And we do apologize for those of you who, who made some things that you made for the whole group and now there's not much. Um, Tara, I'm going to come over and eat lots of heavenly hash today. So, um, and <laughs> apparently there might be others that come with me. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, the last item for today is is, a, is words of prayer. You know, we, we have been blessed as a church family that through this uh, this COVID nineteen crisis that's been going on for the year and a half, we have had a couple people that have uh, had to deal with it. And uh, we've been fortunate that it hasn't been a larger group. But right now, uh, Bob and Sherry Akers uh, are at home because they have been they have tested positive. And uh, let's see, the uh, the Petricks, Amy and uh, Craig Petrick, also let us know today that they're they were contagious, and so they're staying home and, and have it. And our good buddy Scott uh, Leinerberger uh, also has it, so he's kind of stuck at home. So if you have their phone numbers, if you have their emails, maybe a word of encouragement that you could send to them. Tell them they were missed and we look forward to having them back when, when that passes. I appreciate as well from a personal standpoint your prayers for my family. Uh, they're still kind of working through it. My dad was in the hospital all this week with pneumonia but he got out last night and uh, my, uh, my uh, uh, let's see, uh, She's not a doctor, but she plays one in our family. My mom had diagnosed herself with uh, COVID-19, but she did not, she did not actually uh, uh, test positive for it. So mom, mom's been able to quarantine, which was hard from dad, but we're all good. They're doing well. Uh, like I say, a couple sisters, a nephew, a brother-in-law, and my dad have all been kind of going through it. But uh, dad's home and doing pretty well. And uh, I mentioned that you all were praying for him, and, and uh, he, he was just touched by that. 
I had mentioned that Rusty uh, continues to text me every couple days, and, hey, how's your dad doing? How's your dad doing? And I was like, Rusty, I'm just going to give you his phone number. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so thank you all for that. Are there other prayer needs that anybody has before we close today? All right. Well, whether you're a longtime member or the first time to uh, be our guest today, we're so grateful that you've come and worshiped with you. hope we'll, we'll do this again next week, and maybe the weather will be nice and we can enjoy a nice cookout together. Otherwise, we can still continue to enjoy some fellowship here together as a church family. Let's close with prayer. God, thank you so much for your blessings and for your encouragement through, through the word that was preached today, Lord, and I just thank you. I thank you for the, for the ministry of John the Baptist. Um, he was called to be the herald for you, Lord. And he accepted that. He accepted the willingness, uh, that, that desire that you had for him to go out and speak on G Jesus' behalf. And Lord, I pray that you would, would encourage us and, and, and ignite in us that same desire to share the truth. Lord, I pray for my friend. I pray for Ross. That he might come to know you one day. That something someone says, maybe something that I say one day, will cause him to seek you more and that in seeking you he finds you and realizes the incredible sacrifice you have made for not only him but for all of us and I pray for anyone here who might be outside of, of that loving grace Lord that, that they would they would commit themselves to knowing who you are Lord, we just ask that throughout this week your name might be glorified and magnified. We pray for those who in our church have, have uh, uh, become infected with uh, coronavirus. We pray that their symptoms would be minor and that their recovery would be quick. We just pray, Lord, that uh, we just pray for those that have lost someone through this time. And we just pray that they would be encouraged and find peace in you Lord. even though that makes no sense whatsoever to us I just thank you and I praise you today in Jesus name Amen